Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Seeley. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, as well as passionate about the U.S.-Mexico relationship and the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I'm here on behalf of Jane Harmon, who's out of town today, our, our President and CEO. And I'm delighted to be able to present to you Senator John Cornyn, who will give our keynote speech. Um, it is a real honor to have him here. He is one of the, I will introduce him formally in a second, but let me say he is one of the people who has, on the Hill, who has constantly looked out for the U.S.-Mexico relationship and issues of the U.S.-Mexico border and has always been a creative thinker and a proactive thinker about how we make the border work better and how we make this relationship that is so important for our country um, work much better for, for everyone in both countries. Um, I know you start off with a fabulous panel. It was great to, to start off with, with Congressman Henry Cuellar and Will Hurd and Senator Ernesto Rufo, who I will say something about in a second as well. Um, I want to thank the Border Trade Alliance, Jesse Hereford and Noe Garcia, and the Asociación de Empresarios Mexicanos, Eduardo Bravo and Lorena Montes de Oca, who are here, um, for co-sponsoring this uh, with the Wilson Center, and it's been great planning this together with you. Um, it is good that we have senior leadership from Congress weighing in on this important relationship and this important border. And let me also, if I can, before I introduce the senator, mention a couple other people who are here. Alejandro Estivil has joined us, who is the acting ambassador of Mexico. It's an honor to have you here. And also Arturo Sarucan sitting next to him, the uh, ambassador emeritus, can we say? I guess that's an official political term, so former ambassador of Mexico um, here as well. Uh, my good friend Jerónimo Gutiérrez is back there somewhere. There he is, who is uh, the director of the NAD Bank and has really taken the NAD Bank in new creative directions that, that are getting it situated for the 21st century and beyond. Brings a lot of experience as a former deputy secretary and undersecretary in Mexico, but has been immensely proactive in, in what he's done with the NAD Bank. Denise Moreno Duchenne, former senator, state senator from California, is probably around here somewhere, who started there in the back, who started the... Uh, the Border Legislative Conference, bringing together um, uh, legislators from both countries and as someone who's immensely active in the relationship as well. So a, a great, and many other people we should mention. And, and Ernesto Rufo, I, I have to say, who I told him last night, as I tell him every time I see him, is, is still my governor. I, I lived in Tijuana when he was the governor of Baja California, the first opposition governor at a time when there had been only one party for, for six decades, and continues to be a very independent and trustworthy voice in, in bilateral issues between the two countries. Um, with this, let me introduce Senator John Cornyn. He's our keynote speaker. He was reelected to his third term in the U.S. Senate in 2014. In addition to serving as the majority whip, which is one of the most important positions in our country, um, and, and, and he's also a proud Texan, of course, from the great state of Texas, he also serves on the Senate Finance and Judiciary Committees. He has over 30 years of experience working for the people of Texas as a district judge, a member of the Texas Supreme Court, and Texas Attorney General. And he is, as I said earlier, someone who really has always been at the forefront of thinking about how we can make this relationship between Mexico and the United States better, how we act proactively, how we deal with real problems that emerge in this relationship, and how we deal with real opportunities for both of our countries to grow as well. So please join me in welcoming Senator John Cornyn, Majority Whip of the U.S. Senate. To the Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you. And Andrew, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I want to express my gratitude to the Wilson Center and its Mexico Institute for uh, having me, as well as hosting this event in general. And of course, uh, as well as the Association for Businessmen from Mexico and the Border Trade Alliance, who uh, I work with very closely. Um, I look to my friends who are experts who actually live and work along the border for their advice on a regular basis and the Border Trade Alliance is really that voice in so many instances and uh, are always there pointing out ways that uh, Congress uh, working together with state and local officials can work for a better uh, border and one that uh, meets not only our security needs but also our uh, economic needs as well. Recognizing, as I've said, in Mexico and elsewhere, that we are married together by a common border. We can't get a divorce. Not that anybody wants one, uh, necessarily. But uh, we've got to make this work. And uh, I think uh, we, with the, the joint commitment uh, by leadership on both sides of the border is absolutely critical to making it work and enjoying the economic prosperity and security and opportunity uh, for this important region. Uh, which is, after all, out our back door, is uh, worthy of our best uh, efforts, to be sure. Um, I, I don't see uh, Jesse Herford here, but I, there is Jesse back there, of course, the chairman of the Board of Trade Alliance. I, I do see a number of my other uh, friends and colleagues from the Board of Trade Alliance. But um, Texas obviously has a particular uh, interest in the U.S.-Mexican 
relationship uh, with a border that makes up 65 percent of the total border between the United States and uh, Mexico. Um, this is a particular interest to, uh, to my home state and my 26.9 million constituents. Um, so the theme of this event, uh, building a competitive Mexico, uh, U.S.-Mexico border is obviously very timely and maybe you should say, we could say timeless uh, and is so central to the well-being of the border economy, which in turn is so important to the well-being of the Texas economy and the U.S. economy uh, as well. And last month uh, when I visited the Rio Grande Valley most recently and witnessed how the region is working to do just what this conference is discussing today, which is to build that more, more competitive U.S.-Mexico uh, border, uh, I toured the Port of Brownsville, which employs more than 11,000 people and has a statewide impact of more than 21,000 jobs. What a great example of how growth and prosperity at the border translates to positive growth for people and places far away uh, from the Rio Grande. During my time down there, I was also briefed on exciting new developments like uh, one of the newer companies expanding in South Texas, uh, SpaceX, uh, and that important uh, development. As many of you know, uh, SpaceX has selected a location near South Padre Island on Boca Chica Beach to construct and operate the next generation commercial space launch site. And what exciting news that is. The selection of Texas for that site and the border region in particular serves as a timely example of how state and local governments can work together to encourage the private sector to promote innovation and along with it bring the jobs that are so important to the prosperity and future of our people. SpaceX demonstrates that Texas is open for business and South Texas in particular and the sky is the limit when it comes to the benefits that can accrue. I hope uh, exploring how best to unleash those limitless possibilities is a consistent theme of this event. And that is, uh, and that this conference can provide a positive, boundless vision for the border. I see that vision um, centering around three key policy areas, what I want to touch on briefly uh, with you this morning. One, uh, promoting a robust trade relationship with Mexico and nations beyond. Second, investing in infrastructure to make it effective and efficient. And third, looking beyond the border to address shared challenges with our partners uh, to the south. Now, as many here can attest, trade serves as the gateway to an economically diverse and prosperous border. And in Texas, we, uh, we believe that uh, NAFTA has uh, been a very uh, net positive uh, influence on our region and particularly our relationships uh, with Mexico. And our economy in Texas uh, relies very heavily on that trade. According to recent figures, my state leads the nation in exports by significant margins. In 2014, we exported about $289 billion worth of merchandise. And of course, trade specifically with Mexico is a key, one of the keys to our economic success story. Of the $289 billion worth of goods exported from Texas last year, more than $102 billion went to Mexico, our top market, representing more than 35 percent of our state's total exports. But as we know, this massive amount of trade does not just flow one way. Imports from Mexico into Texas have exceeded $90 billion worth of goods for the past several years. And bilaterally, the U.S. trade relationship with Mexico is substantial by any, any definition. Total trade in goods and services between the two countries was recently estimated to be about $536 billion. But I think that's just the beginning of what it could be. In promoting trade, we're supporting a competitive border as billions of dollars worth of goods are trained, trucked, and shipped through our ports of entry and border crossings. One of the ways to encourage trade along our borders is through legislation that the Senate uh, passed just this last month. You may have noticed they had a little uh, uh, speed bump in the House that they're trying to work through last Friday, but uh, we're still working at it. Uh, this legislation, uh, commonly known as Trade Promotion Authority, is something I strongly supported as the mechanism to enable the negotiation of key trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the TTIP the European uh, trade agreement uh, in, in, in line. Uh, 
I support this because I believe it's always good to have new markets where you can uh, sell the things you grow, uh, the livestock you raise, and the manufactured goods that you make. Uh, I don't see any downside to that at all. And indeed, what we do see is the, uh, the jobs and the wages uh, that uh, increase that go along with that as uh, we benefit from this 40 percent of the world's GDP that's represented by the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, by promoting common sense legislation like the Trade Promotion Authority Bill, the precursor to these trade agreements, and indeed it makes no sense to have 535 members of Congress try to negotiate them, hence giving the President uh, this authority with the parameters uh, included in the TPA, we encourage the opening of new markets for American goods and services, which I think is, uh, by any measure, good news for hardworking American families. But increasing our trading relationship is of little value if we can't get goods back and forth efficiently and uh, safely across the border. Which brings me to my second point. Quality infrastructure, including new and improved bridges, roads, rail lines, and ports are needed to get these hundreds of billions of dollars worth of goods across the border in a timely manner. And infrastructure is greatly needed to accommodate increasing amount of goods shipped through our borders every day. Customs and Border Patrol officers in the Laredo Field Office alone processed $162 billion worth of imports in 2014, a 14 percent increase over the previous year. And specifically, our border communities must harness the innovation and problem-solving strengths of local leaders and the private sector to help us tackle the challenges affecting these international crossings. We don't have to look far for examples of how local and regional leaders can address these border challenges. Texas has more than a few who stand out. Across South Texas, local communities and bridge owners have banded together with uh, Customs and Border Protection under a federal pilot program designed to boost staffing levels at the bridges. This has resulted in increased throughput and reduced wait times, benefiting not just the border communities, but the variety of goods and people moving through the region's border crossings. Under this same pilot program, the city of El Paso is investing significant local dollars to improve traffic conditions and reduce border wait times at its bridges. I was pleased to learn that the Texas legislature that recently adjourned uh, came together in a bipartisan fashion to make additional resources available for a similar initiative designed to expedite agricultural processing at our ports of entry. And I'm sure that some of you here in this room uh, had their hand in that effort, including my friend Sam Vale and Sergio Contreras. Uh, I'm sure you were very much involved in those discussions in Austin and uh, encouraged them to make this wise investment. I'm proud of the leaders in Texas and elsewhere who every day are working to prioritize necessary improvements along our border to benefit the lives of those on both sides. And I'm thankful to work alongside of good people like Rigo Virial, the superintendent of Bridges and McAllen, and he and his community advanced improvements at the Hidalgo and Ansel Duas bridges that keep McAllen and South Texas competitive. One great example of the power of infrastructure to enhance trade and improve the business climate is the West Rail Bridge between Brownsville and Tamaulipas. This international bridge is the first rail bridge built across the border since the early 1900s. Unbelievable. And will play a huge role in enhancing trade between the United States and Mexico. And we would not be poised to reach this historic milestone if it weren't for the vision and leadership of people like Cameron County Judge Pete Sepulveda, who kept this project moving along despite many challenges over the years. While actually getting it built is not always an easy task, infrastructure that facilitates trade clearly has great potential to bring economic diversity, competition, and vitality to the border. So we need to continue to prioritize reasonable measures that will help our trade become more efficient and more effective for our border communities and for our country's economic vitality. And I must say, uh, you know, while we're focused specifically on the border, the benefit uh, to the United States in general is uh, somewhere on the order of six million jobs that benefit from that binational trade with Mexico, something that seems to get lost often when people focus on the border as a regional 
or maybe a state responsibility and not a federal and indeed a national uh, priority. But looking beyond the border, I want to note that this trade and the infrastructure that supports it needs a safe and secure environment in which to operate. So it's important to all of us here in this room, those of us who get how important border economies are to the bigger picture, to highlight what should be obvious. The better we do, the better Mexico and others to our south do, and vice versa. And that means our security and economies are inextricably linked. So we would do well to look for opportunities to work together even more, to strengthen our border by advancing good policies away from the border, which is my third and final point this morning. I saw one clear example of this recently when I visited Juarez, and I was able to see why American investments in Mexico's long-term security, things like the Merida Initiative, have been so significant. The assistance provided by the United States to the Mexican government under the Merida Initiative has allowed the United States to work even more closely with our friends to the south to help reduce crime in parts of Mexico. And at the end of the day, by improving security in Mexico, this partnership improves the security of both of our nations. And it underscores the point that we have to work together. We really don't have any other choice. But we need to also focus on things away from the border because these are the things that invariably impact the border and beyond. Now, while this isn't groundbreaking news to anyone here, it's, uh, it's not adequately recognized by many here in the nation's capital. Unfortunately, some of the story, the story that makes the headlines, is the uh, focus on corruption, trafficking, and violence, which are indeed part of the story, but certainly not the headlines. To counteract this, and to put it in the proper context, both of our countries need to continually build on our already firm foundation of bilateral cooperation to make our joint successes even better known, and to find opportunities for even greater engagement. Of course, government can't do it alone. And at the end of the day, the involvement and insight of local leaders in the private sector is absolutely critical to creating a, an environment that fosters and promotes greater cooperation between nations. Uh, recently, uh, I was telling uh, the ambassador and former ambassador, I was in Mexico City with uh, uh, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, and we had breakfast with uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And at the Chamber of Commerce were, I must, there must have been about 30 or so representatives of the American energy sector who were looking forward to, uh, to, to, to trying to navigate uh, the new energy reforms in Mexico. And a uh, lot of excitement there, a lot of good reason for excitement, um, because obviously the things like the, uh, the, the, the shale plays don't stop at the uh, U.S. border, uh, but uh, portend great opportunities for economic development and jobs and mutual cooperation going forward. I think uh, the energy sector indeed is one of the most exciting stories of, uh, of this 21st century in so many ways. Its impact on jobs, the economy, and security. And uh, so it's a story that uh, I think is waiting to, to unfold uh, to an even greater extent than it has already. But I'm really pleased that AEM is co-sponsoring today's event, uh, Building Bridges of Lasting Relationships to Connect Business Leaders of both the United States and Mexico is more important today than it's ever been, and it's always been important. By enhancing our bilateral relationship and meeting the regional challenges head on, we can demonstrate that the border is a stable environment, ripe for economic opportunity and competition. So to conclude, today's event is a hugely important one because many simply don't appreciate that a strong, healthy, and economically vibrant border provides so many benefits to the United States and our friends in Mexico far beyond its immediate impact. Quite simply, for America to prosper, the border must thrive. And what that means is that what happens in McAllen, in Laredo, in Far, in Eagle Pass, or El Paso does not just stay there. It travels up our interstates and along our freight corridors and along our rail networks and it impacts the manufacturer or small business owner in the heartland of our great country. So I hope going forward that my colleagues in Congress will um, 
perhaps expand their view uh, of both the challenges and the opportunities that our border and our bilateral relationship uh, hold. Uh, I know that uh, as Mexico continues to, uh, to prosper, uh, many of the challenges of Central America are now showing up uh, on our doorstep. And I see Mayor Darling here, for example, who could uh, speak volumes about that experience uh, and about the, uh, the great way local leaders have, have uh, stepped up to deal with it. Uh, by standing along, alongside the diverse and robust businesses and organizations already serving our border communities, I'm convinced that our southern border is only just beginning uh, to see its potential as an economic hub for the United States and Mexico. So thank you very much for letting me uh, come today and share a few thoughts with you. And I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thanks a lot. As the saying goes, I'll be happy to answer or dodge a few questions. <laughs> Great. If well, there's time, time for questions, so uh, who wants to start? Gentleman right here. And if you can wait for the microphone since we, we are videotaping. Uh, gentleman right in the middle here. And if you can identify yourself as well. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Senator. Uh, Michael Camunia is with Manat Jones Global Strategies and formerly Assistant Secretary of Commerce working on the U.S.-Mexico relationship. First of all, thank you so much for uh, your leadership and for your comments. Very, very uh, spot on. And, and it's encouraging, frankly, to hear somebody uh, in the Senate speak uh, with that kind of clarity about the importance of the relationship. My question is this. It, it seems to me, having done advocacy in this space for some time uh, on the importance of the border, that so long as the border is thought about and conceived as, and Mexico is understood as primarily a border issue, mm. um, the, the leadership in the Congress is missing out on a broader perspective, which is the subject of North American competitiveness. I know many uh, members of your party are concerned about the competitiveness of the United States and economic growth and, and our ability to compete in the future with rising powers around the world. It's always surprised me that we, if we had the, the Republic of South Korea just across the border, you know, we, we would th be thinking very differently about our economic prospects. In reality, we do. We have a, a, an economic powerhouse that's completely integrated, as you know, with our own economy. I guess my question to you then is, uh, what can be done to better position in the Congress itself um, the U.S.-Mexico relationship, not as an issue of border management as security or even as an issue of just, you know, friendly trade relations with an important trading partner, but rather as an economic imperative for nor broader North American competitiveness. I, it seems that that has been a, a missing focus in the Congress, and if, if Mexico were understood as part of a holistic strategy for our long-term competitiveness, there might, be, there might well be a different approach to how we manage the border and other aspects of our relationship. Well, that's a great question, and uh, the fact is that uh, meetings like this, I think, go a long way to help inform people more broadly about, um, about that uh, competitiveness and the importance of the North America as a region. Um, as you know, sometimes events overtake uh, our calm, rational discussions, and um, particularly, for example, I'm thinking about the uh, unaccompanied children showing up uh, in places like McAllen and elsewhere that, that uh, got uh, a lot of attention. And indeed, I think there were more senators and congressmen traveling to the border region for that than ever showed up there before. And I can invite my colleagues from uh, around the country to join me at the border. And obviously, our border uh, region is uh, always hospitable and welcoming and, and is more than happy to, uh, uh, to help inform and educate uh, members of the Congress, uh, um, most of the time we have a hard time getting them there, there unless there's something uh, in the news that they feel like they need to be better informed about or respond to. And um, so I, I wish I had an easy answer for you. Um, I do think programs like this are important. If, as uh, we are making some incremental progress along the areas that I discussed earlier, I think as, as the uh, bilateral re economic relationship has grown and as Mexico is now undertaking its own reforms to open up its economy, uh, I think we're going to see um, the, the facts and uh, life overcome uh, the politicians and the policymakers because I think we're, they're going to 
sees such a great opportunity there, and business is going to continue to integrate our economies in ways that sort of will bypass uh, some of the policymakers. So I, I, I think obviously there are challenges, but uh, you know, it's uh, there's the the problem is uh, the news uh, doesn't cover good news; uh, it covers bad news, um, car wrecks, uh, bank robberies, murders, things like that, <laughs> and uh, anywhere they happen. So uh, that's just the nature of the beast. So we just need to work harder and uh, not just rely on on Congress. But I think there are, on a bipartisan basis, people like uh, you know people like Henry Cuellar, who uh, who I know was here earlier, who I've worked with very closely, Philemon Vela, uh, and other border uh, congressmen. Uh, this is something that's important to me. That's important to to te Texas, and I think I've I have an opportunity to use. Uh, the office that I am privileged to serve in to help uh, use that as a platform, a larger platform, to talk to groups like this and to work with my other colleagues to help expand and, and put this re relationship in context. You're exactly right, and I don't, uh, I don't have a silver bullet answer, but uh, we have to keep at it. Thank you, Michael. Um, other questions or comments? Right, uh, Senator Rufo. Good morning. Good, good, good to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm the president in the Mexican Senate for the Border Commission. And we have a common son named the Mad Bank. Mm -hmm. What is your vision about the Mad Bank? How could we maybe use it in order to do sustain more of what we need in order to make uh, uh, our nation's borders to do better? Thank you, sir. Thank you for the question. I'm, uh, I'm not an expert, uh, but I know the NAD Bank has made uh, very important contributions uh, to, uh, to, to the border region and the infrastructure that's important, uh, so important to both of us. Uh, I think perhaps there is more, much more opportunity using uh, existing institutions like NAD Bank to do more of what I talked about earlier when it comes to the infrastructure, because I think uh, trade agreements, infrastructure and dealing with issues away from the border that I mentioned earlier are to me the three elements of, of uh, that are key to our success. But certainly uh, uh, NADBank is, uh, plays a key role in that. And uh, I'm not an expert in NADBank. Perhaps I would do well to uh, get a uh, update uh, uh, from the leader here uh, about uh, what NADBank is currently doing and what potential exists uh, because I haven't had that in a while and I'm sure I would benefit from that. But it's an important part of the answer. Senator and Jesse Herford, uh, Border Trade Alliance, just want to publicly thank you. You have always been a champion, not just for the Texas-Mexico border, but for the entire U.S.-Mexico border. So thank you for all your efforts, and we look forward to continuing working with you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Anyone else? We have time for one or two. Chris Wilson here from the Wilson Center. And organizer of today's event. Th thanks very much, Senator, for being here again. Uh, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how that, you know, it's, it's important, obviously, for our ability to export across to Asia, but it's also about connecting North America. And I think that's one of the things that we've maybe heard a little bit less about is this is actually a way to take some of the gains that we had through NAFTA and take them to the next level by updating and improving on that agreement. You know, what, what's your vision for, for what we can achieve with it? But also, the, the politics are very complex. I know it's not on your side right now, it's on the House side. Uh, but what do you see in terms of the prospects of getting trade adjustment assistance and, and trade promotion authority through and actually passed so that we can uh, complete the agreement? Well, I'm, a, I'm all in when it comes to uh, trade because I've seen the benefits to Texas and obviously the NAFTA experience. I still remember when Ross Perot was talking about the giant sucking sound uh, <laughs> that would become NAFTA, and I haven't seen it. Uh, I've just seen a net benefit to my state and to the country and to both of our, uh, the United States and Mexico as, as a result of that. And while I do recognize that the benefits are not evenly distributed, uh, uh, for example, I was, uh, and I mentioned uh, being in Mexico with uh, Senator Kane recently, we also went to Honduras uh, to what tragically is the most uh, dangerous neighborhood and the most dangerous city and the most dangerous country in the world at the time um, that has a lot of problems that, again, speak to the necessity of looking, uh, looking uh, more than just to the next country, contiguous countries, but down 
completely into South America and making sure we try to help them uh, strengthen their own institutions and security and opportunity there. Um, it just speaks to the, uh, uh, when the, when the President of Honduras said he was a little nervous about some of their textile uh, activities uh, and uh, what the benefits to Vietnam would be under the uh, TPP. So these are complex and uh, there's not always uh, the intended consequences, but on the whole, I think this is something we, we must do. And indeed, you know, the, this is, we find from people in my political party find ourselves in the, un, in the strange position of, um, of agreeing with President Obama 100% on this. And indeed, some of the criticism for Republicans has been, why would you want to give the president more authority? Well, you know, it's because we agree with him on this point. We can disagree on others, and I hope we're, you know, we can actually conceive of uh, those two concepts at the same time in our brains, that we could agree on some things and disagree on others and work on the things we agree on. <laughs> As to the politics, um, I th obviously uh, trade adjustment authority, which is what I would consider uh, you know, basically unemployment uh, compensation on steroids, uh, is, to prop, is to help with some of that unevenly distributed uh, benefit. And when people are displaced and they need uh, additional training and benefits, that's the purpose of trade adjustment authority. And uh, indeed, that's what was so surprising when the House passed the trade promotion authority uh, which is uh, which Republicans tend to support, and the Democrats, uh, by and large, have not supported. Uh, and then they voted strategically uh, to defeat trade adjustment authority because they saw that as a way. Uh, some of the, the the opponents of trade promotion authority saw that as a way to to tank uh, the essential bargain, which is both of these would have to pass uh, together in order to make uh, trade promotion authority a reality. So I know that the Speaker and, uh, and uh, Senator McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, have been talking to uh, President Obama, and there is a new strategy at work, uh, and we'll see. Uh, there, it is a logical path, uh, pathway forward, but as you know, logic does not always prevail uh, here in Washington or in politics in general. Uh, but I think this is something that's so important. We have to to see it all the way through and give it our best uh, to make it a success. We invested a lot of effort in uh, trying to get Trade Promotion Authority just out of the United States Senate. And to see what happened in the, in the House was uh, really disappointing last Friday. My hope is we can pick up the pieces and we can put it, uh, put it back together and get it done. Senator, let me ask you a final question if I can, and then we, we have to let you go back to the Hill. But you know, one of the, the real challenges in this relationship between the United States and Mexico is perceptions in both countries, right? And we started off, you go back 20 or 30 years, on both sides of the border, we distrusted the other, we saw the other as a threat in a different way. You know, we're now in a, in a place well, we, well, where... we do have a little history, Andrew. We do have a little history, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why our friends in Mexico look at the United States with a little uh, little distrust sometimes. There, there, are, there is a bit of history there, there is. But um, over, you know, in the last few years, we're at a position where immigration, particularly undocumented immigration, legal immigration has gone way down for the first time right. since 2007. Um, we've been working together to deal with issues of transnational crime, and economic activity is an all-time high between our two countries. Mm -hmm. Is that changing perceptions on the U.S. side? I won't ask you to comment on the Mexican side, but, you know, it's, it's a two-part equation. But on the U.S. side, do you feel that, you know, when you talk to people in Texas and around the country, that the perception is caught up to reality, or, or there's a lag time there? I think there's a lag time. Um, and honestly, uh, I mean, the, the figure is, and you alluded to this, but no real net uh, migration from Mexico to the United States because, frankly, Mexico's doing a better job uh, producing opportunities in, in, in Mexico for people who were born there. And that's you know, certainly what all of us would prefer, to be able to find work and opportunities where we, uh, where we were raised. Um, but again, the, then the, just when things start to settle down there, uh, then we get uh, the unaccompanied uh, children from, uh, from Central America as a result. And I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Can you imagine the horror for a mother in Honduras to say, I'm going to send my daughter or son on, uh, up through uh, Mexico uh, through the networks that, uh, that make money uh, transporting migrants. Um, 
I think their life, they have a better chance for a brighter future by doing that than I do for them to stay here with me where we live. What a horrible choice uh, that a parent uh, would have to make. And so I, to me, that just, uh, it just, it, I'm, it makes me even more determined uh, to do what we can with Mexico and our other friends to try to help those countries uh, try to build their security and their economy in a way that it will allow those children to stay with their families and not feel like they have to escape to the United States just in order, in order to survive. So I, just as one part of the story begins to settle down a little bit, uh, other things pop. And I, will, um, I won't uh, belabor this, but I think uh, uh, some, of the, some of the polarization as a result of the president's uh, executive action and the subsequent litigation uh, made that even a more difficult thing for rational people on both sides of the aisle to come forward and try to solve in terms of our broken immigration system. There is, con there is a, a, a core consensus as to some elements of our broken immigration system and what we need to do. And I, my view is we've tried comprehensive immigration, which I know a lot of people would love us to see us do, but we've tried it for ever since I've been in the Senate and we've never succeeded. And so why not try to do what we can do um, and to begin to build uh, hopefully some uh, mutual trust and some confidence that we can actually address these important uh, issues on a bipartisan basis. I think um, we need to continue to try to do that. Thank you, Thank Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today.